Well, so your mission is out there, but your identity is in here, and um, I want you to know that God loves you just as you are. He loves you so, so much. I, uh, I told you I grew up right over here in Web City, and it was like 1991, 1992. There was really only one place in Web that you could go and get late night tacos, late night anything. And so we used to uh, frequent this place, my friends and I. And my friend Jeremy and I thought it, we always thought it was funny to go in public and pretend to be people that we weren't, right? Like to just act a certain way that we weren't actually like that. And then our friend Matt never did that, but he just acted like he's the kind of guy that would just, you know, take care of people like this. And this one particular time, I decided I was going to be kind of like overly hyper and demented and a little bit wacky, which was somewhat normal, so in character, you know? And then Jeremy had, now this is like early 90s grunge, okay? So he had the long, greasy hair, like you wouldn't wash it for like several days because that would get the grease thing, and he read in some magazine that Kurt Cobain did that and Eddie Vedder, and so, all right, so he was gross. And he had the long hair, and he decided he'd be one of those people that just like hardly says anything right? But he strings his hair all in his face to where you can barely see his eyes. So we go into this taco place, and so I come in super fast, and I'm running and talking and, and, and like moving around, and I'm telling the lady everything that we want. I almost order one of everything on the menu, and then I one by one take them off until finally we get, or I get, just what we want, or what I want. And the lady, and so I'm snapping and talking and talking really fast, and finally when I'm done, the lady looks kind of past me to Jeremy because the whole time he's standing there with his hair in his face just (laughs) not moving at all and we didn't work out what we were going to do so it's all impromptu and she looks past me and points and says okay well what does he want and so I turned around and so now pretend she's over here and I turn around look at Jeremy and I thought it'd be funny to act like he was in a trance right so I was like Jeremy 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 what do you want and again I didn't know it was coming Jeremy stands there, hair in his face, and then he goes, flips his hair back. Ah! (laughs) Bean burrito. (laughs) For real, true story. I didn't know. So I jump back, like, on the counter where the cash register was, you know, trying not to break character. Right? And it was so hard because this part of me that like actually likes people, I wanted to turn around to the lady and go, it's okay, we're just kidding. But I had this image of her going, oh, <laughs> 911, right? Like, <laughs> I didn't want that to happen, and so I stayed in character. So I'm like this, looking at Jeremy, trying not to laugh. Finally, I turn around and say, he wants a bean burrito, one bean burrito. And then we get our food, we stay in character, we leave. And that was kind of fun. But um, here's the deal funny story, but like in real life, a lot of times we pretend. And to be honest, and I've worked with middle school students for a long time, still do. And middle school, I've got a middle schooler. I've got a 13-year-old. And middle school is a time of life to where it's very tempting to just pretend. But part of that, and we adults know, we give you a lot of grace for that because we did it too. And in middle school, you're still kind of figuring out who you are and who you want to be. And you begin to experiment with a lot of different ways of being. It's a time to pretend a little bit. It's normal. But God, God knows the real you and God knows the real me. Listen to this verse. It's a little bit, this verse is a little bit disturbing. In Hebrews chapter four, verse 13, it says, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he's the one to whom we are accountable. God sees everything. On the outside and on the inside, God sees it all. In secret, in public, God knows you just as you are. But that's not the final, ultimate truth of the Bible. That's not the last word. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. This is uh, the fisherman poet. John, one of the guys, one of the fishermen that hung out with Jesus. And he writes this letter to, to a bunch of Christians, and he says this. We know how much God loves us, and we've put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in God, excuse me, all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. So over 20 years working with students, and if I I could convince you all of one thing, and I've already said it, 
But this, and, and now I work a lot with college students. I find myself saying the same thing to college students. That if I could convince you of one thing, if I could convince you that God actually loves you and even, even likes you just as you are. And yeah, God's big and he's gonna, he wants to do some things in your life and in mine and make some changes, but he already likes you just as you are. That would change everything. Did you know just a chapter before John, the poet fisherman, wrote what we just heard about God is love. We put our trust in God's love. In 1 John chapter 3, he says, at times our hearts, now that word in the Greek is, is thoughts. The Greek people, the heart was the, the wellspring of how we thought and reasoned. If your thoughts condemn yourself, John writes, have you ever, you've condemned yourself. Oh, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did. Oh, I hate myself. Oh my gosh, look at how she looks. Look at how I look. I wish I, I don't have, if, or, or oh man, um, what do you, what's your mission in life? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Like you guys are amazing. You're spiritual. Mine's probably stupid. And you condemn yourself for whatever the thing is. John says, if your thoughts condemn yourself, it's okay. Because God is greater than your thoughts. God already knows all of your problems, all of your self-hatred. God already knows the things that you're actually not good at and that you're actually kind of a turd about as a human being. God already knows, and he still likes you. Like that, the great news of the Bible is God knows you and sees you just as you are in all of your mess and all of your glory, but he still likes you. He loves you deeply because God is a lot like Joey. Okay, so my senior year in high school, I'd just become a Christian, didn't grow up in the church, came to the Lord, kind of funky, and now I'm a Christian. And uh, I grew up in Web City. Web City was a big football school, and my class had just won the second straight state championship. And of course, we thought that was the best thing in the world. And it's actually at the end of the school year. So we did all that in the fall to the end of the school year. And this preschool that also served as an after-school drop-off for a lot of grade school kids, they asked a bunch of seniors to come and like hang out with the kids, right? It's football players and whatever, right? So we come with our letter jackets on. And I know it was in May and it was probably hot, but it didn't matter. When you had that many patches and you had state championship rings, you wore it all the time, right? So we show up to this preschool and all the kids start gathering around Matt and Grant. Now Grant was a giant, right? Like he was a defensive end and a huge guy, ended up playing in the NFL and Matt was the quarterback. So they were all around these guys. And it they all wanted to be a quarterback. Even the chubby kids that I was going, you're destined for the offensive line, bro. <laughs> you know, I didn't tell them that. But they, I'm going to be a quarterback. And they're all around. That. Nobody comes and talks to me. And I, I get it. I was 18 and should not be that insecure. But I'm over there in the corner going, y'all are a bunch of punks, right? Nobody wants to know about me. Nobody's asking me how many touchdowns I scored. No. And like, for real, I'm having this moment. And, and I feel a little tug on my pinky. And I look down, and it's this kid I later find out. His name is Joey. He has a green shirt on, but it has a purple dinosaur, you know? <laughs> Barney. And he has green Lee jeans. Not Levi, Lee jeans. He has cowboy boots, one pant, uh, one pant leg tucked in, one normal. And he's got, like, for real, straight-up mullet going short in the front, right? Business in the front, party in the back. He's got this hair, so cute. And he asks me, hey, do you want to play with me? probably four years old. And I'm like, yeah, I want to play with you. These guys are a bunch of chumps. And so I go and I play with Joey. We have a blast and we play and the teacher comes and she says, hey, you boys come outside, play football with the big boys for a while. And I did because I'm like, I'm going to check a couple of these fifth graders, right? And then I'm going to talk about me. They're going to be talking about, no, I didn't, I did. And um, maybe once. No, I didn't. But, I, but, I, but Joey couldn't come out and play. He was four. She said he was too little. And so when we were done, they told us we could leave. They're, Thank you so much for coming. You guys can leave. We all came in my dad's uh, minivan, right? Because that's cool. <laughs> and, we, and so it was time to go. And the guys were like, let's go, Frizzell. Come on. They were hungry. It had been like two hours since they'd eaten. <laughs> they had to go probably to the taco place. Wanted to leave. But I wanted to find Joey. And I remember I couldn't find him. And I'm looking around. And it was almost as if the, the, the crowd just parts like the Red Sea. And Joey comes running 
mean to me, right? That it would have been great if there was music. And I got down on a knee, not because I wanted to hug him, because I, mean, I was an 18-year-old dude, right? Super insecure. I'm not going to hug a little kid, stupid little kid. But, I, but he's little, right? And so I wanted to get on his level. But he runs and jumps like on me and hugs my neck and squeezes my neck. And before I can really say anything, he says to me, hey, when I get older and I become a big boy, if you come back, can, I, can you be on my team when we go outside and play football? And I'm like, oh, yeah, bro, totally. I mean, I can do that. True story, he kisses me on the cheek and then just runs off. He just, he just does that to me and leaves, leaves me there. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do. Right, like I'm 18. I tried to be a tough guy my whole little life, right? And I'm just like, okay. And I'm a new Christian. And so the world has gone from black and white into full color. And so all of these emotions, I'm just like, and so I get my keys, or no, I'd already thrown the keys to Matt. They started the car. I'm coming out. And I'm a little bit embarrassed in the next part because I kind of lied. But I get into the van, and Matt is looking at me, and Matt goes, bro, are you, are you crying? And I was like, no, I have allergies, which was true, but that wasn't the problem. And we left. Here's what I want to, that's a great story. That's one reason to tell it. But also because God w taught me something about that, like that God's a lot like Joey. That God doesn't care if you're very good at the game. Right? God doesn't care if you're very, if you have everything figured out about this game called life. God wants you on his team, not because you're amazing, not because you're brilliant, not because you're so talented and so pretty. Right? And all the pretty people, good job. You were born. You did a lot of work. You were born. Good job. But like, but God loves you and wants you on his team because he knows you. And because he loves you, and because he is God, God is love. This is not the good news of the Bible. This is the great news of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the world with wonder and splendor and brilliance. Oh my goodness, right? There's so much about creation, and I know we're going to talk about sin, and I get it, but have you looked at the world lately? I know there's a lot of bad, but it is unbelievable, it's brilliant. It's beautiful. There is so much good in the world. God called it good over and over and over. I mean, think about it. We have hippopotamuses, right? Have you, have you paused to think about the hippopotamus just to look at the wonder and the beauty, <laughs> right? It's awesome. You got giraffes. Like, we got horses and zebras. That's cool, right? But God was like, it's not enough. And so he takes one of them and, right? Giraffe. Right, we have butterflies, or even better than butterflies, or butterflies in your stomach. Explain that, right? Like when you get like nervous when you're around that certain boy or certain girl, right? Or, or what about goosebumps? I'm not talking about the book or the movie. I'm talking about the things on your arm. Like you have an inspirational moment. Like I watch a movie and it moves me in my spirit, and I have bumps on my arm. Like what is that? It's crazy, right? I can think about myself thinking, right? Like it's just, there's so much. And when God created humans in this beautiful poem that we have in Genesis, God said, you know, everything else, he was like, that's good. Oh, that's good. That's good. Oh, that's good. He makes human beings. And he's like, it is so good. It's very good. God has made us beautiful and wonderful. We're made in God's image and he's given us freedom, but we know the story. Eventually, as human beings, we have ignored God's way. We had freedom because we're made in God's image. We get to choose whether or not we will live in God's good world, his good way, or if we want to do the arrogant thing and try to do it our way. And they did, and we did, and all do. This is part of the sin, and ever since... Sin has uprooted God's good world. And we've got racism and violence and wars and bullies and bigots. And it's everywhere. And it's not just out there. It's, it's right here. And it's right there. And it's right there. And it's here. And it's everywhere. And that's the sin problem. God loves. Sin separates. And so God sent his son to pull it all back together. And he's not done. The cross and the resurrection wasn't a one-time moment. 
that would renew all things someday, like God is redeeming the world even now. He's redeeming humanity even now. And part of that is part of your mission that's out there and right here to be a part of this renewal of all things. Listen to this classic, John chapter 3. Here, here's back to the poet fisherman guy. In verse 16 through 18 in the message it says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need, to be, no one need be destroyed. By believing in Jesus, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending Jesus merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came, Jesus came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in Jesus is declared not guilty, and they are declared redeemed. Anyone who refuses to trust in Jesus has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe, to trust in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. Because you and I cannot fix our sin problem or any other sin problem in the world. Not, like more rules, better government, better religion. It's all been tried. It's all been found Wanting. And I would encourage any leader in the room, whether you're a student or a pastor or an adult, just a reminder, a reminder that like teaching and preaching and screaming about morality and moral goodness is not enough. It's never been enough. It will never be enough. And so what we need to do is what the Bible says, and that is fix your microphone is what you do. And, but what we need to do is be more like God. Romans chapter 2, it says that it's God's loving kindness that leads people to repentance. It's a fancy way of saying that the love of God ruins your life in the most beautiful way and you begin to want to live God's way. Not because of rules, not because of social context, because everybody in the youth group is going, man. So like new Christian, 18 years old, started going to church. And like there's this one time I went to this event and they're, they're telling you to bring all your CDs forward. Yeah, CDs are these little disc things and you'd put them into, they played music. And they wanted you to bring them all to the front and smash them if they weren't Christian music. I'm like, sucker, you crazy. I got all kinds of money wrapped up in my CDs. I'll take them to Hastings and sell them, right? And there, somebody tells me, no, oh, someone else might buy that ACDC. And I said, I'm not selling the ACDC one, bro. But like, I, someone else might get the bad music, right? And I'm like, they're going to get it. In. I wouldn't say, but like th this, this more, in the, but there was this guilt trip for so many, right? As if, as if loving God, as if like my change is because like, Okay, I better step in line, right? And I don't know about you, but I've got one of those personalities that like as soon as I'm told to step in line, I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to go this way, right? And God's still like working it, and it works. God's working it works because he loves me, and I know he loves me, and we're called to be like him. And so parents in the room know this. You can give your kids, you know, your kids get this age, right? Your rules and regulations and consequences, it's all good and it's all needed, but influence, love, loving influence is really like the, the real that can actually bring them back in when we need to. This is just like God. And I'll tell you this story. It's a true story. This blew me away when I, when I, when I heard this. Uh, well, let me just tell you. Uh, John was a, uh, an African-American that lived in Cincinnati. And he was a part of, I, if you know anything about the gangs, the gang world in, in Cincinnati in the, in the 90s, it was one of the worst in the entire country. And John was a part of a, of a, of a black gang. And in his mid-20s, he met Jesus. He experienced Jesus. And that's a whole other story. But he became a Christian. And he began to work in the inner city of uh, Cincinnati he began to work in this like after school program that they, it was a Christian based thing but, um, but it was also I mean it was Christian run by Christian people but it was kind of the state funded thing and they would mentor these inner city kids and this one kid named Willie began to, to begin to come to the, to the after school thing he was 16 years old punk and uh, you'd have known him right when he walked in because uh, he, he had a shaved head and he had tats all over and some of those tats were, were like Nazi symbols. Willie was a white kid that belonged to a white supremacy gang. 
And, but John is the guy kind of assigned to him to be his counselor and his tutor. And as much as Willie didn't want to do it, he was still kind of on the, on the low. Like, no one really knew he was coming there. His friends didn't know. He kind of sneak in. And John really was a smart guy. And so he was t- helping Willie with his homework and different things. They began to play basketball a little bit at the after-school program. They became, became friends. Long story short, John led Willie to the Lord. Willie accepted Jesus, became a Christian. And then they began to talk about the gang. And Willie said, John, i got to get out. But there's only one way out. It's the same way in. And John knew the gang world. He understood what he meant. That the only way out is you go to your gang brothers, you tell them your reason for wanting to leave, and if they accept it, they all take turns beating you up, and then you're out if you survive. And so Willie was like petrified because he was going to have to go and tell these guys that he'd become a Christian, he wants to get out, but he's going to have to take this beating. And John says, I'll I'll go with you. I want to be there with you. I'll go as support. And of course, Willie's like, uh... (laughs) Have you looked in the mirror, bro? Have you looked at my tattoos? Like, these guys hate you without even knowing you. And But John wouldn't take no for an answer. He said, I'm going. I'm going to be there with you, okay? And so they, they're there. They're in this room. And Willie explains to his gang leaders and members that he has come to Jesus. He's become a Christian. And he even said, the hatred I had in my heart for people like John, I was wrong. And I'm not judging you guys, all right? but I I know that I can't live this life or lifestyle anymore, and I'm here to take whatever the consequences are. The leader of the gang was listening to Willie, but he was looking at John the whole time. I failed to mention John was like 6'5", and not skinny. Not overweight either. You feel me? Like a big dude with lots of muscles. Intimidating just simply by walking in the room, even though he was one of those gentle giants. This gang member's looking at John, and finally... The gang member says, all right, Willie, we'll let you out. And I'll tell you what, we won't even touch a hair on your head. But then he looks, he keeps a stare with John and says, if you let us all beat you up and you can't fight back. And of course, Willie interjects and says, no, man, this is, but John said, okay, and stepped forward. John was engaged at the time to be married, had a whole future ahead of him, but he loved this kid. And he said, I'll do it. And Willie tried to stop him, but a couple of the gang members held him back while the rest of them beat John up so bad they broke almost every bone up in this region. They put him in the hospital, almost killed him. But when I heard that story, I was immediately floored by how similar to another story, a man who took the punishment, an innocent man who took the punishment that other broken, evil people deserved. A man who had never committed any sin. Of course, this is Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, one of the most profound verses in all the scriptures. It said that while Christ, Jesus, had no sin, the Son of God, perfect, had not sinned, even still, God made him become sin for us so that we could become the righteousness, that we could become right with God, that Jesus stood in our place, that he took our punishment. And something else that he did on the cross, it it might be my favorite thing about the cross, is that he stood in solidarity with us. That on the cross, God found out what it was like to suffer emotional and physical pain in the extremes. He understood, he felt, he experienced in his body and soul the injustices of the world, the evil of the world. And Jesus stood with us, God with us, Emmanuel. That when, when you and I go through heartache and pain and death in the families and divorce and brokenness, and when people say racial slurs to us or about our family, when people hurt us physically, emotionally, we will cry out. Where are you, God? Because that's human. That's normal. But my hope for you is that you will come to the conclusion and understanding or hear the voice of Jesus say, I'm here. I'm here in the dirt, in the mud, in the pain, in the blood, in the sweat, in the tears from the cross. I understand. I don't always pluck you out of the pain, but I always, child, always walk with you through it. For I am Emmanuel, God, with you. This is the great news 
of the Bible, of the gospel, of the world, that God sees you. He knows you. Every bit of who you are. He knows it all. And he loves you just as you are. So much so that Jesus would die, that he would stand with you. And even to this day, as he said in his last words, I'll be with you always. As you're about my work, as you're about my mission, as you're a human being on the earth, I'll be with you. He might not always pluck you out, but he will always stand with. And this is the promise. And this is Jesus' invitation. When he says in Matthew, come to me, all of you who are burdened, who carry heavy weight in your soul, self-hatred and taking on the weight of the hatred of others, the words of others, the the rejections of others, he says, come to me, come to me, because I'll give you peace. I'll give you rest for your souls. Jesus offers no magic. He offers no like spiritual invisible cookies that we can eat and everything just becomes better. I have no idea where that stupid metaphor came from, but there it was, right? There is no such thing as magic. There's something better. A creator, the same one who made the hippos and butterflies in your stomach, who makes your hands and palms get all clammy when you're next to that beautiful guy or beautiful gal. The same God who created it all stands with you, offers you an opportunity to know him and to live this life as he walks with you. I'm gonna pray, we're gonna sing, but I wanna encourage. For many of you, you've just been reminded, probably for most of you, you've just been reminded of the great love of God, of the scandal of God's grace, of how good it is, of why Real Christians smile a lot, right? Like the bigness, the safety of God's love. I hope for the majority, I know you've just been reminded, you know this, that the world, that life is dangerous and it's hard and it's painful, but God's love is safe. He knows you and he loves you just as you are. But I'm gonna assume that there's a few that were invited and came and And maybe you don't know this good, safe, big love of God. Maybe as as you've thought about God, and maybe religion's done this to you and you've been in the church for a long time, but you have this idea that God's just waiting for you to mess up. And when God looks at you, he's disgusted. Can I tell you? This is as deep as I'll go and I'm pretty much done anyway. Do you know that the way you think that God thinks about you is the most important thing in your life? because it will shape everything else. The way you think, God thinks about you. When you, those of you that walk in shame, that's not from God, but some of you think it's from God that he sees the stuff that you just struggle with over and over and over again that you know better and that God is constantly in your, in your thoughts. He's constantly like, oh gosh, figure it out. You're so gross. That may be something someone has said to you, but that will never be what the creator of the universe revealed through Jesus Christ says to you. He knows you. He knows you. He sees it all. And he likes you. He loves you. And he wants to walk with you. And if you don't know that love, my encouragement, there are pastors and leaders here that know you and love you. And they've been walking in this safe, big love of God for a long time. And I'm going to challenge you to have courage and to share with them at group time just to say, I don't, I've, I don't know this love of God through Jesus. I mean, I know stuff about it, but I've never experienced this in my life. And just start that conversation because it's a conversation. And if, and if there's even a few here that do that in group time tonight, well, then this will be, have been so good. Oh, my goodness. Pray with me. Let's pray. You can even stand. We're going to sing. So let's, let's, uh, let's get ready for that. Let's stand. Oh, thank you very much. I just want to bless you. I just want to bless you before we pray and sing. Um, whether you're old or young and whether you've been a follower of Jesus for months or years or you're just not yet may you know 
deep in your soul, in the basement parts of us that maybe we don't show to everybody. May you know there that God sees you, that he knows you just as you are in ways that maybe you've not revealed to anybody else. God sees you, he knows you, and he adores you. May you know that the Father of Jesus Christ runs to you. Lord Jesus, I pray. I pray for your spirit of courage in this place. God, for my wonderful friends. Um, specifically, God, for those who, whether they've been around religious things for a long time or this is very new, for those who have always thought of your love as being very, very distant and dangerous. Who have always seen themselves in scenes of shame. God, may they know from your spirit. May they know in ways that it just won't make sense. Just may they know you are here with them. May they know. May they feel. May they sense even now you smiling upon them. As Zephaniah says, as you singing and rejoicing and dancing over them because of your great love for your people. May they know. And for those that don't know, but as they sense this possibly for the first time, I pray again, God, that your spirit of courage would push them and move them to speak to an adult that they trust about what's next. And God, we will sing and we will lift you up and we will praise your name because Jesus, you are so good. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.